tonight, let's uh, just get right to it. We're going to jump right into Psalm 16 and read it together tonight. Psalm chapter 16. Now, I, uh, let me just kind of forewarn you here, I guess. Um, I'm going to read out of the NIV, but I'm going to read interpretively, which means I'm going to change the NIV a little bit. Uh, if you catch it, great. If you don't, well, then, you know, that's fine. And I'll explain maybe a few of these things. There's, Psalm 16 is, uh, especially in the first few verses, uh, there's some really difficult uh, Hebrew issues here. And there's a couple places where um, I kind of just take a little, I, I think that e, the NIV has uh, got it a little off. So uh, let me just say that at the outset. And as we go through, I'll make that a little more clear. But I don't want to uh, put an obstacle in front of the sermon by uh, reading the um, unchanged NIV. So this is the NIV R tonight, NIV Rick, okay? Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight, and the sorrows of those who run after other gods will increase, will multiply. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup. You've made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will dwell secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to be the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16. Now, I've picked this psalm tonight for a couple reasons. The first reason is uh, because it is uh, just a few after 11, which was the last psalm we're in, and we're working our way through the book of Psalms. Uh, but also because uh, this, of all the passages in all the Bible, is... Uh, the New Testament reference for the resurrection of Jesus Christ prophesied. Uh, we uh, find this as the basis of that. And being that it was just Easter, uh, I think it's a good idea for us to, uh, to focus on that as uh, Easter was just last Sunday. So, uh, so let's uh, dive into this together uh, with that in mind. And there is a lot here. So the first half of the psalm, we're going to kind of uh, go a little quickly, and I know I have a lot of fill in the blanks for you, but uh, try to follow along if you can, and uh, then we'll focus on the last uh, three verses or so uh, talking about the resurrection. At least that's what I've planned, you know, famous last words. So here we go. The first uh, point I want to make here tonight, uh, and this sets up, I think, the whole psalm, is that David is secure because the covenant-keeping Lord is his God. David is secure because the covenant-keeping God is his Lord. Notice here a couple verses right off the bat that we need to notice, which actually is, I should say, is our first point. But notice verse 1 right away. Keep me safe, or you could say preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Then he moves on the rest of the psalm. Verse 1 sets up what the rest of the psalm is about. This is about David seeking the Lord's safety, the Lord's preservation, the Lord's help. For in you I take refuge. That sets up everything that's coming ahead. And that needs to be there in our mind. But before we can go any further in the psalm, we need to understand a couple things about it. And that first thing is our point A here, that this psalm assumes the Davidic covenant. This, this psalm assumes the Davidic covenant. Now, we can see this in, in uh, several verses here. We've already read verse 1. Uh, but look at uh, verse uh, 8 and 10. First of all, in verse 8, 
David says, I have or I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now this phrase, because he is at my right hand, uh, is uh, something of a signaling back to David as king. Uh, David as God's appointed king. God is at David's right hand because David is the appointed king. Uh, but we know a little bit more than, than even that. Uh, look at uh, verse 10 as well, which David says, Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now, we're going to explain a little bit more about this when we get in a little later, but I think here also, David is talking about himself, God's Holy One, God's set-apart one. Uh, but certainly, as, as we'll see in a minute, there's a little bit more than that going on here. David is also uh, talking about the Messiah, the Holy One, uh, that uh, God will ultimately not let see decay. And, and we'll explain that a little bit more. But you, you, we can't read this psalm, I don't think, without both Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 in the back of our minds. So let's go to those. And since we're already in Psalms, why don't you turn to Psalm 2 with me. Psalm chapter 2. And I think, uh, as we pointed out before, too, these psalms as a book are not just a random collection of psalms. And in Psalm 1 and 2, we had kind of the macro structure of all the themes of the psalms. Uh, psalm 1, about the psalms themselves and the Word of God itself, that that is uh, the, uh, the riverbed that we are firmly planted by, that we get all of our life and nourishment from. But Psalm 2 that the Psalms are about and the scriptures are about uh, the coming Messiah, the coming Messiah. So Psalm 2, verses 6 to 9, say this. God says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill, which is David. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. Now David is saying, I'll proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. David here is talking about himself, but he's certainly also talking about the Messiah, the Messianic king, because David knows, he knows this already, uh, and we know, as readers of the Psalms, that David did not possess the ends of the earth as an inheritance. Uh, he died, and he had uh, Israel as an inheritance, uh, and, and that was it. That was it. David, in Psalm 2, I think, and in Psalm 16, has in the back of his mind 2 Samuel 7. Let's turn back there as well, 2 Samuel 7. Oops. I'll just read a couple verses, but I think this is important for us to have as our background. 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 10 and 12 to 16. Verse 8, they said to Samuel, oh, I'm in 1 Samuel. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, 2 Samuel 7, verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. This is God appointing David as king. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. So this is God setting up David as his king, but then verse 12 to 16, God says this about more than David. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he will be my son, Psalm 2 imagery here. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men, but my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established through forever. So 
With these two uh, ideas in the back of our mind, or these two, um, the Davidic covenant, first of all, but then also Psalm 2, as we read through the Psalms, uh, when David is talking about uh, himself as God's anointed one or holy one and talking about ruling and reigning, uh, things like this, uh, we see David there, but we also always see the Messiah, directly or at least indirectly. And I think here in Psalm 16, it's meant uh, directly. So uh, let's keep that in our mind, first of all, that this psalm assumes the Davidic covenant. Point B, David's greatest security is the supreme goodness of God himself. So we have in our, the back of our minds the Davidic covenant, but now what is the meat of David's reassurance that he is secure? Well, David's greatest security is the supreme goodness of God himself. Verse 2, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing, or I have no good thing beyond you. Now, there's two ways that we could perhaps interpret this. Uh, One of those ways is to say that maybe this means that God is the only source of good, that nothing good uh, comes from anywhere else but God. James 117 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above. But I don't think that's uh, really the, the intended meaning here, the, the, the focus of the meaning here. I think what David is actually saying is that God is his greatest good, the supreme good. There is no other good beyond God. Uh, God is our greatest good. Nothing else can compare with him. Verses 5 to 6, I think, make this a little bit more clear where David says, uh, and this is where I, I, I really want to disagree with NIV. NIV says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion in my cup. But the Hebrew actually just says, Lord, you are. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is my cup. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. David here isn't actually talking about his physical possessions. David is talking about the Lord. The Lord whom he says he has no good beyond God is his greatest good, and God is his portion and cup. And this, uh, in the back of our minds, if you want to look this up later, this reminds us of the Levites. A very similar phrase was said about them, that they, they had no portion in the land. The Lord was, was their portion. The Lord would be their portion. David's saying the same thing here, very similar uh, terminology here. God is his good. God is his portion. No matter what happens in this lifetime, uh, God is his portion. Then verse 11, I think, uh, caps it all off. David says, you have made known to be the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David's focus in this whole psalm is God himself, whom right now, he has as his portion and cup and whom in eternity he will be in the presence of, at the right hand of, filled with joy and delight and pleasure. This is what David means, that God is his greatest good. So we might say in response to that, that no good thing can compare with God's supreme goodness. Sub point one here, no good thing can compare with with God's supreme goodness. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Nothing good, (laughs) there could be no good beyond the good I have in you. And verse four, David contrasts this, where he says, the sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood, or I will not participate in their uh, offerings Uh, their sacrifices, or take up their names on my lips, the names of other gods. Substitutes, (laughs) Substitutes for God multiply sorrows. Substitutes multiply sorrows. Now, substitutes are a lot easier for God. God is uh, complex. Theologically, he's simple, it's another conversation, but uh, God is uh, not a God that is simplistic. God's also not a God that I can control. He's not a God who uh, 
stoops down to my level of understanding as far as who he is anyway. He communicates to my level of understanding, but he is way beyond it. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways higher than my ways. I prefer substitutes. They can be simpler because I make them up. Uh, They can be controlled by me because, well, those are the kind of substitutes I prefer. But no substitutes can give us real security. No substitutes can give you forgiveness from God the Father. No substitutes can remove the, the guilt that we feel in our souls. No substitutes can give us resurrection. No substitutes can promise us eternal life that's worth anything. No substitutes can truly satisfy. Though I prefer them, they cannot deliver. I've quoted this many times before, and you've probably heard it many times as well. Otherwise, that C.S. Lewis wrote this, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. No good thing can compare with God's supreme goodness. Number two, God himself is our greatest inheritance in the Father, Son, and Spirit. God himself is our greatest inheritance in the Father, Son, and Spirit. We already read verses 5 and 6 where God says, or David says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup. (laughs) No No greater thing could we inherit than God himself. Than God himself. And our greatest reward as Christians we know in eternity is God the Father himself, God the Son himself, and God the Spirit himself. Uh, David does not, is not aware of this, we are as Christians, that you know, we have a relationship that is much more profound than just a generic relationship with God. You know, when I was a child, I had a generic relationship with God. I believe that God existed. It just makes sense. I believe that there was a, a higher power and being who must have created all this. I mean, because look at how incredible everything is. Look at this world and and just the beauty and the wonder and, and just how could you not believe in God? Lots of people believe in God. But as Christians, we don't have a relationship with God. No, no. We have a relationship with God by the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. We have a relationship with The Holy Spirit who indwells us personally, intimately, lives within us somehow, has given us new life, has breathed back into us, and walks with us every day. We have a relationship with God the Son who took our sins on the cross for us, uh, calls us his friend, calls us uh, his brother, sister, is the head of the church is our Savior who has become us in the flesh. We have a relationship with God the Spirit, God the Son. We have a relationship with God the Father. We we are the family of God. We all have the same Father. We are all brothers and sisters. God is our Father, our Dad. He's given us an inheritance with him of the kingdom, of eternity. A place in his house, the Father's house, where there are many rooms, his palace. That's the relationship we have with God. Not with God generically, but with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Our triune God. Which is incredible. We don't have time to read it. As we were going through the hymns tonight, Rodney picked hymn number seven there. Um... I'm forgetting the the name already, but read that hymn again. It talks about a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the last phrase, the chorus, is, you are the one that we praise. 
you are the one we adore. Our, this, this is it is hard for us to understand or even talk about. This is the relationship we have with God, a God who is three at one, three persons and one in essence. How we can get our minds around this is, is too much for us. And in eternity, God will make it more clear. We will experience to the fullest our relationship with God the Spirit. We'll experience to the fullest our relationship with God the Son, even seeing him, touching him. We'll experience to the fullest our relationship with God the Father, being in his presence, bowing before the throne, as that hymn also uh, says. Seeing his glory, looking at his face. It's incredible. So God, no good thing can compare with God's supreme goodness. Number two, God himself is our greatest inheritance in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Number three, God himself is our greatest eternal joy. God himself is our greatest eternal joy. Verse 11, you've made known to be the path of life. You'll fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. <laughs> joy, delight, pleasure, et eternal, forever. This is the end goal for us. You know, if we were completely selfish, if we were just completely selfish, if all we cared about was ourselves and our own happiness, then we would do everything within our power to worship God. If we really were selfish, the, the problem is that we're like, we, we can't even be selfish correctly. We're so sinful, we can't even be selfish correctly. If we really knew what was best for us, we would worship God, but we don't. We, we settle for less all the time. But God himself is our greatest eternal joy. Nothing even in heaven could compare with the first time and the eternity of being there to fully experience and understand and, and live in relationship with God the Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father. <laughs> we, we just... We just try to imagine it now, and we can't get there. So David, number one, David is secure because the covenant-keeping Lord is his God. This God, this God who is our greatest good, this God uh, who is our inheritance, uh, whom we will have eternal joy in at his right hand, this is the God that we worship, and therefore David is secure. But let's move to point two. David is secure because he will overcome the physical corrupt, the corruption of death through Jesus the Messiah. David is secure because he will overcome the physical corruption of death through Jesus the Messiah. We see this in verses 9 to 11, but let's make two main points and then uh, finish with a response. Point A, David expects resurrection from death personally. Okay, David expects resurrection from death personally. Now, there's, there's lots of different interpretations of Psalm 16 here. A lot of people, a lot of commentators, maybe even most, view 9 to 11 as, as David purely talking about himself. But I, I, I think there's more there than that and for the reasons I started out with. Having 2 Samuel 7 and even Psalm 2 in the back of our minds, there's more here uh, that I think even David realizes. So let's begin. Uh, let me make that point with two points here out of verse, verses 9 to 11. First of all, the subject of his security includes his body. The subject of his security includes his body. He says in verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Uh, David's really talking about all of him, his, all of himself. Uh, but when he goes on to talk about his flesh not seeing decay, uh, I, I think David is really looking and understands that there is supposed to be some type of physical resurrection of his body. And I think the Jewish people understood, and, and largely in the New Testament, there, there's lots of debates about it, of course, the Sadducees and whatever else, but the Jewish people understood that they were looking forward to a time where God would literally physically resurrect their bodies and bring them back into the land of Israel and reverse the curse and make everything right. And I think David is looking to that here simply because uh, he is specifying his body, and, and we, we might ask the question, is this, well, is this just figurative, or is it really literal? But I think because 
he's talking about corruption later, we can take it as he's meaning this more literally. But number two, the time of his security is his future eternity. The time of his security is the future eternity. Uh, we see this in verse 11. Uh, I think most clearly, and so we'll go there. We could make a point out of verse 10 too, but we'll just go to verse 11 where David says, eternal pleasures are at your right hand or, or pleasures forevermore. Uh, David is looking ahead to eternity. Where else are there pleasures forevermore than in God's actual presence? So David in, this, in the context here, in the immediate context, is talking about his future life, not his present life. Or at least if he is talking about his present life, he's looking ahead uh, to the ultimate fulfillment of his body dwelling secure. So David expects resurrection from death personally. That's point A. Point B, though, David prophesies of the future Messiah's resurrection. David prophesies of the future Messiah's resurrection. I, I should make one point we don't have time to make. In, uh, in point A, you could also write down Psalm 49, 11 to 15. You want to do some study on your own. There's precedent in the Psalms themselves uh, with very similar language here for this uh, verse 10, not abandoning David to Sheol, talk, to Sheol talking about eternity. Uh, and so you, you might want to turn there later, but we, we'll move on. Point B, David prophesies of the future Messiah's resurrection. Here we'll focus on verse uh, 10. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Again, I think David's talking about himself, but I think he ups the ante when he uses the phrase the Holy One. Uh, this, could, this could just be talking about David, but I think there's more here than that. And again, with the context of Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 in our mind, he's talking about the Messiah. Moreover, the fact that he says, you won't let me decay, uh, is, is certainly not true about David himself, unless he's just talking very figuratively, metaphorically. He doesn't really mean decay. He just means, you know, God will, at some point in the future, resurrect him, something like that. Uh, I think he's, he's talking uh, all the ultimate fulfillment of this, at the very least, is the Messiah himself, is Jesus Christ. Now, if that's all we had to go on, uh, we, we might kind of question that rubber heads a little bit more about it, but uh, turn with me to, well, don't turn with me there because we don't have enough time, but turn on your own and, and look at what both Peter and Paul say about this passage in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 13. They both, they don't just quote Psalm 16, but they both say that David understood this about himself. And uh, I think in Acts 13 in particular, the point is made that this could not be about uh, David because he did see corruption. And the implication of that is that David also understood that, that this was about more than him. This was about the Messiah. Uh, also, we should make one last point here that you can look up later, but Luke 24, which is where we spent all of our time last Sunday at Easter, three times is emphasized that all of the scriptures proclaim the death and resurrection of Christ and resurrection. That so much so that Jesus even chastises his disciples for not believing it from scripture. And then Peter in Acts, uh, you know, right there, right at the beginning of Acts chapter two and Paul later in Acts 13 their main justification for the resurrection is this passage, which I think very easily uh, gives us the conclusion that this is the passage Jesus used. Jesus, when he was on the road to Emmaus with the disciples, he went to Psalm 16, and he said, hey, look, this is about me. You know, Paul and, and Peter, they're not making something up. They're not adding meaning to it. I think Jesus himself is making the point chastising his disciples for not believing it, Psalm 16, you should have known the Messiah had to be resurrected. Moreover, even if it is specifically and only meant to be an expression of David's confidence in God's promise to him, its fullest expression is obviously found in the Messiah, and Acts and the New Testament make that very clear to us. 
So David here is prophesying of the future Messiah's resurrection, which is also the reason why he can be confident for himself that he will be resurrected. David knows something has to be done. David knows we live in a world of death and decay. And the Messiah is the one who will crush the head of the serpent. The Messiah is the one who will reverse death and destruction and the curse. The Messiah is the one who will rule and reign and bring peace and justice and life to this world. And it must happen through the resurrection. And David takes comfort and confidence that Yes, he will be in God's presence, but also that his body will not be allowed to decay finally, ultimately, because Christ's body, the Messiah's body, was not allowed to decay. We conclude with one final point from this passage, and that is simply this. Believe that you are eternally secure Because Jesus has gone ahead of you to the right hand of God the Father. Believe that you are eternally secure because Jesus has gone ahead of you to the right hand of God the Father. We too can pray and confidently assert to God the words of Psalm 16 in verse 1. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Keep me safe now and into eternity, for in you I take refuge. In verse 8, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. We know that this is true of the Messiah. He is at the Father's right hand on our behalf. So that we will be there at God's right hand experiencing pleasures forevermore and seeing our Father, seeing the Son, seeing the Spirit forever. I want to conclude with uh, one little story here. This is out of uh, the pocket history of the church. It's a little book, a little church history book that uh, the Men's Book Club we've been going through and really enjoying. And uh, this is uh, written by my favorite professor at seminary, so a little plug for him, Dr. Jeffrey Bingham. But in uh, the very early chapter introduction, he's recounting his uh, time when he was in the catacombs outside Rome. The catacombs are a very early Christian burial site of uh, believers, and in the catacombs, are all these brothers and sisters in Christ with all of these murals uh, and, and uh, early writings and things on the walls, uh, which gives us a, a look into our ancient brothers and sisters' hopes. And let me read this to you. There I was in the catacombs outside Rome. I was thrilled, curious, and fully attentive to what the guide was saying. Never mind that in my haste to get inside, I'd accidentally joined a German group with a German-speaking guide. These sites of ancient Christian burial held my eye captive. I'm I'm sure my mouth hung open. I stared. I got chilled, although I was wearing a coat. This was the second burial site I had visited in as many days. The day before, I had taken a train south to Anzio, Italy, to the American cemetery where the fallen brave of World War II were buried. I had visited the Museum of the Great Amphibious Landing of January 1944, and I had walked I had walked what I thought was the invasion beach. Gazing out to sea and then back to the city, I tried to envision the ships, the landing craft, and the troops. Now, here I was, walking below ground at the very place where some of my earliest brothers and sisters in Christ rested, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies. After all, as our guide reminded us, their bodies, even in death, are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Their loved ones had left artwork and inscriptions symbolic of their faith, Here slept Christians who even in death had a living hope, sharing with their Lord the scorn of death, for them too the tomb was merely temporary. Of all the early inscriptions, I find my heart drawn most to the one that marked the grave of Damasus, Bishop of Rome in 366 to 384. Quote, He who trod the tumultuous waves, 
He who restores life to the seeds which die in the earth. He who could unloosen the lethal bonds of death after darkness and restore life after three days to Martha's brother. Will, I believe, make Damasus rise from his ashes. I'm going to read that again, but I'd like you to put your name there. I'm going to put my name there. He who trod the tumultuous waves. He who restores life to the seeds which die in the earth. He who could unloosen the lethal bonds of death after darkness and restore life after three days to Martha's brother. Will, I believe, make Rick rise from his ashes. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, our one God, thank you for this incredible gospel message that we who are dying and will one day be dead have the greatest hope that our bodies will not ultimately see corruption because you, Lord Jesus, rose from the grave. We too will rise. We too will be in your presence, Father. We too will experience the joy eternal of the Holy Spirit constantly filling us. Amen.